Martin Fiskeit from uh, Gemar in Kiel. Uh, and uh, Martin is uh, one of the members of the transition team for the Future Earth Program. Uh, his title will be Selected Topics on Ocean Dynamics in the Wider Context of Climate Variability and Global Sustainability. Martin. So I knew Alan would have a hard time pronouncing the title, so I, thought, so I changed it, right? So it's, <laughs> the bottom line, like Wally would say, it's news from the conveyor, actually. I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and thanks for inviting me all, because what I call home looks like uh, Jessica's, you know, it's a little bit snowy, not quite as much. And, and I was actually wondering, uh, uh, the day before yesterday, for which soccer team I should be rooting. For the one of the proxies, for the one for the models, right? And you can, you can follow the talk and see where I come from. Neither of the worlds, maybe. So, um, I want to start with picking up, I was actually amazed by Kachami's talk last night, that he never showed a single graph that we show lots of in pages meetings, right? Like time series or something. So I think you can talk about climate change without that. I think that she has shown us to do that. And I want to start with this graph, which we all know from the uh, last uh, assessment. And uh, it's the global mean temperature. And I just want to make one little remark there. You, you see this cooling bit here? I'm pretty sure in the next assessment that won't be there anymore. Because it turned out to be a data issue in the ocean record. Right? So sometimes we readjust and we work our, our records. In this case, there's been a, a different correction that made to the UK ship fleet and the US ship fleet. And with the, the wars, one came in and then the cooling showed up in the proxy, as it were, in the correction, but it wasn't actually real. Uh, so this is something I just want to highlight. So even curves like this sometimes do change as we get better at analyzing them. It even happens with observed uh, stuff that I deal with. If you take the more regional perspective of this graph, which is the North Atlantic, you can look at many different things of them. I'm interested in all time scales. When I get public lectures, I always point to that cooling drilled towards the 80s. And there were reports published then that were heading towards a cold world because they looked at the last 30 years of data. And that's clearly the right assessment. Most of us are also interested in this trend, and I want to show you a depiction of this trend if you now take a global picture of a regional view of the trend. That's a paper that uh, we've written with our Chinese colleague, Li Shen Vu, he is, uh, is the main author. It's, uh, it came out uh, just last year. So this shows you a map of the 100 year long sort of observed SST trend locally. It's not really observed, because we have many observations, but not global. So what we do, we take the observations where we have them, and we use an ocean model where we can. We put the models and data together and do an assimilation. So which soccer team is that? Is that going to be the next pages conference? You're going to have a third team, yeah? And do a match, I don't know. So, uh, but what it shows, which is kind of interesting, that yes, and, and what we've done here, we subtracted the global average of 0.6 degrees uh, warming that you all know of. So we're just looking at the regional difference. And what you see is that the Gulf Stream, the Kuroshio, sort of the Malvinas current, uh, the Angolas current, the boundary currents of Australia, all show three times the warming trend than the rest of the globe, or the global average. Now that is an exciting signal to a physical oceanographer. You say, well, wow, how can that happen? Why did the warming world pick up the boundary currents? Do they go faster? They couldn't, you know, couldn't be warmer just in the boundary currents, right? So actually, we don't really know the answer. Our most plausible explanation is that there probably was a shift towards polar latitudes and all boundary current systems, most likely due to changes in the position of the westerlies in the atmosphere. It's not fully explained. There are some issues with the data, possibly. But I'm just telling you, if you go to the long time series, even in, quote, observational data, interesting challenges show up that we, as physical oceanographers, should understand better than we actually do. So here's the first glimpse of the kind of things that I won't talk much about. Now, observations, obviously, are key for this, because it's based on observation filled in this model to build. So we do worry quite a bit about how we can make sure that observations in all oceans happen all the time. There was some question to you earlier about then you use the data from the Indian Ocean to drive the models, and we certainly try to get better. And, and I think the way we want to get better is paying attention to society. And I like Jackie McLeod. She's the head of the European Environment Agency, and she says, measuring what we must manage. I think we all, certainly after last night's lectures, understand that this planet is sort of managed by us. I mean, it's affected by us. Maybe not properly managed, but how could you make some recommendation to us as a society if you don't know what goes on? And there's many ample examples where things all of a sudden happen, and you're surprised, whoa, really? 
if we lose all the fish in the ocean? We didn't know, right? So, so measuring what we must measure is a good mantra. And so with the way we think about observation in the ocean these days, and I urge you in the paleo community to think about that too, is there are requirements. You know, society wants to know is the ocean warming, is it hot? And they want to have the answers. They don't want to have dots on the maps. They want to have sort of the big answers. And so the way we think about it is you've got to motivate the expensive stuff, the coring, the taking of the paleo data by the big questions. And the oceanography is expensive as well. So that's how we do it. And then we come up with what we call essential ocean variables. And I wonder what the essential paleo-oceanographic variables are, or the paleo land variables are. And if you really think hard about it, I mean, it's clearly in a resource-constrained world that we're all in, you can't measure everything anywhere. So setting up priorities is something maybe pages should think about, and we're trying to do that in the ocean. Now, we're quite fortunate. We have a network, and that's solving one of these questions. To heat mostly, which is called Argo. These are these robots. Uh, 3,000 of these robots are in the ocean right now. Each of them is as tall as I am. They go down to two kilometers these days and come to the surface and every 10 days give us a profile of the upper two kilometers. And what's fascinating about these robots, we have 3,623 floats as of yesterday in the ocean. And within six hours, the data are in the public domain. And I really want to say this in India because. Uh, about 100 floats are paid from the Indian government as contribution to Argo, and they're also shared in real time. And I'll come back to the data sharing issue at the very end of my talk. It's a fascinating project, and we've managed to get all the countries to share the data. China, India, Japan, and many others who are not so used to sharing the data in real time. And what you can do with it is, for example, you can watch now the heat content of the ocean go up, that's here, the upper two kilometer in red. But what I find very fascinating, that we can now start to look at the gray curve here, that is the ocean below 700 meters. So even below 700 meters, you see a noticeable warming. And a lot of people didn't expect this, that we should see this already, that the deep ocean is responding fast, right? It's not a slow response, it's actually a fast response. What exactly is happening, how it works, and how much even the ocean below 2,000 meters warming, we don't know, because the robots only go to two kilometers. But I think it's fascinating things you can do with news, with news, new data sets. So our main talk is going to be focused on two topics. So news from the low and sinking regions, again, coming back to the conveyor. Here's my version of it. So you have the cold water going south here, and again, it's still simplified, and they have the warm water going north. But you see lots of these circles here. These are supposed to be mesoscale 80s, and we'll talk about 80s a bit, because 80s, I think, are keyly important in what we do, and uh, I think they'll become in particular important when we talk about the cells. Now, I'm not going to talk about this, but I will say, this was great outreach, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> and the reason why I thought it was great outreach, because whenever, when is a paleo scientist a movie hero? Right? I mean, how many new movies do you know where paleo science becomes the hero, right? It's a great really love story and everything. The science wasn't quite accurate, but it wasn't, you know, there's worse movies than that, right? So, so it was good outreach, right? So, so what I really want to talk about is this, uh, and this is for the land people here more. So in the ocean, uh, we, we are interested in this circulation that brings the warmer temperatures forward. Somewhere in the north they sink and return as cold to return flows. And you see the 3D picture here in the movie. And uh, what we're really interested in is, is how fast this sort of, you can solve it, uh, sort of conveyor, as we call it loosely in the paleo world, or the heating system of the planet, called loosely in the climate world. And actually, the ocean heating isn't as big as many people think, but it's a significant part for the heating of Europe, and it's maybe 20 or 30 percent. Most of it's done by the atmosphere. And what I want to remind you, these are the kind of pictures and those that we have in mind in the paleo world. But what's really happening out in the field is this, right? I mean, so where's the Gulf Stream? You see it? Let's go and measure it, right? Let's go and take, uh, and I haven't put a slide just, just to Alan here. So this is the thing on a 10 uh, on an ocean model that is fairly high resolution. I'll show you a higher one in just a second. But I just wanted to remind you, this is a sea of eddies system, right? Full of eddies. It's, there's no nice mean flows. That, 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 that's just in our sketches, right? The real thing is very turbulent. Now, when you go and do what, Alan, just for you, right? So global hydrography, we used to take a ship across from one continent to the others and publish a nature paper. These days are long gone. 
Uh, but so we plan these uh, cruises and do repeat observations. And when you go in a case like the lava, we'll see here is one of these sinking regions. I'm just going to show you what comes out of many, many of these cruises. You get to do a time series, right? You guys do a core, and you get everything in one go. You know, we have to go many, many, many times, right? To make a time series like this. This is from Igor Yashé from Canada. And it shows you the upper three kilometers, top to bottom, more or less, of one of these sinking sites, the Lago de Sea, uh, from 1940 to last year. And it shows here, on the top, you can see uh, the temperature, on, on, on the bottom, uh, sorry, on the top, you see salinity, on the bottom, you see temperature here. And I, when I was out there, and this was right here, it was the coolest period of all. We had a lot of lava to sea water formation, very active convection, and in recent, recent years, you don't see so much. But I want to show you, so this is the bigger picture, warming, cooling, warming. And if you just take the robot view, the Argo guys, which are in effect now, you get a much higher resolution. You can look at seasonal cycles, and you can even see that in particular last winter we had a bit of convection resuming after almost a decade of no convection. And again, robots are great because they're there all the time, and they really can get into the details that we weren't able to look at before. But I just wanted to give you, that's the kind of variability we all deal with. And I always wonder, if you have a proxy record, what is it recording? Late summer, winter, annual average, and that's uh, a big challenge, I think, for us together. Now, we like ships, but again, and we like robots, but there's other robots we like as well. These are these moorings, right? We put instruments in a particular place because they don't move about so much, and they allow you to look at time series of things, uh, and you have to go back every year or every other year to replace them. And we have these moored arrays in various central passages. So here is Ursula Schauer from Avi, and she maintains a mooring array across the front straight. You see lots of moorings here, pretty expensive stuff, but it allows you to really average over these eddies and mesoscales and get a more long-term perspective. I didn't bring a time series here. It's pretty noisy. It's not very conclusive because here's the boundary between the Arctic and the Nordic seas. It's a complicated place, and we're not sure that that's the best place to pick up signals. It's almost impossible to measure transport because there's so much eddy activity there. Uh, we have people like Bogi Hansen from the Faroe Islands. So now we're moving a bit south. The Faroes are here, right here, where the overflows happen. So this is one of the main overflows where cold water spills over to the North Atlantic. And if you look at his record from the last 10 plus years, it's fairly steady. Although he did write a science paper in, in the year 2000 to talk about the decline. <laughs> <laughs> that was science. So uh, Kirsten and, and Dennis, uh, both Basel, uh, look at the other gateway here, the Denmark Strait, and look at that. Pretty steady, right? Noise here and there, but it's pretty steady. So that's that thing. So we uh, have in our lab, uh, and so here's the Labrador Sea I've showed you before. We keep a mooring array going here at the exit of the Labrador Sea, where all the stuff comes through. John Nassir always says the Labrador Sea is like a toilet. Everything flushes through, right? So. <laughs> Uh, so here's the export of the Labrador Sea, and again, we have, can do it in more detail. 12 years uh, of observations. Again, pluses and minuses, pretty steady. This is a good sign because the eddy noise is not so big, so that's why we like it. However, uh, here comes in Arne and Klaus uh, from Kiel, running a high resolution ocean model at 20th of a degree. You see these eddies are much more explicit here, a lot more structure. So now we can ask the question, Let's take an observation of the model here, the same place where we have our more observations, and look at the time series from 1980 to a few years ago. And we only really had this full array of moorings because it's pretty expensive out there for two years in the beginning, and in the end, in the middle, we had a reduced set. But uh, if you look at the full transport observations here from that array, and recently, okay, this is what we saw here, here, little changes, but then the model says, well, maybe it was more active in other years. So if we had our expensive mooring array here and there, we would have discussed a big observed decline. Right? But then if you had it here and here, we said the, the MOC goes up, right? So it shows you it's a tricky business. You have to be there all the time. Now, there's another great project that we have going in the Atlantic called Rapid Mocha. And you see uh, many uh, investigators here, including Jörg Morowski. It's a UK-US effort. Uh, quite a few moorings out uh, across 26 north here. And that's the maximum transport, place where the maximum ocean heat transport goes. And there's lots of things you can learn from these records. And I'm just going to show you the summary graph. Of course, the council has done that analysis with the whole team. 
And you see here the transport, that's the amount of overturning, so north and south, sort of how much spinning you have in the, in the MOC. And again, you see quite some fluctuations on um, monthly, this is the 60 day average, sort of on by several months time scales. More fluctuation in the beginning, then it was a bit more quiet, then the funding almost ran out here. They were pretty happy to have this, right? And that gets the funders and just says, ah, maybe we should keep going, right? Because you see, but again, if you take an observation here and there, you see a massive decline, right? But then it comes back up. So it behooves you in these noisy systems, you really have to keep up the observations. And what I found fascinating about this work is this, actually. Here's a shipboard observation, you know, six cruises. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, actually a six minus. So it's five in this graph. And this was a nature paper, obviously, right? You take a hydrographic section and you say transport is 23, 19, 16, 15. Come on. Time is changing rapidly to conveyor stalling, headband news everywhere in Europe and the, uh, in, in the US. And then these guys take these world observations here and just work up what the seasonal cycle is, right? You work with the seasonal cycle, that, that's a seasonal cycle. Now you just adjust your cruise for the season that you've used it with the average seasonal cycle. And then this one drops here, this drops there, this drops there. So it was an unfortunate sampling of the seasonal cycle that made it to nature. Amazing. So, uh, so here's the forecast. Um, uh, I'm not going to go all the way. I have a few more slides, actually. So the CMIP three runs uh, show the decline of the overturning circulation. But it's not starting now. It should start in 10, 20 years from now. And the latest ones, which is a subset of those, seem to be as much of a spread and about the same as before. So we'll see in the full report in a few months what the latest is. So I think that it looks sort of similar to what it was before. And right now, we really shouldn't expect much of a change, and we really don't see it, I think. Now, it's easy to get cold water down. But how does the cold water come back up? Yeah. So that's the hard part. How do you get cold water to become warm again? And where does actually this thing close off? We think the southern uh, uh, hemisphere is a place that is quite important in that because the uh, deep water comes back and mixes a lot and so on. Mixing is probably an important role, although we don't really find it. It's, it's really an unsolved riddle. So news from the southern rising regions. Clearly, wind plays a role. Stefan and others have done some good modeling that showed us that if you have winds uh, the way we have it in the southern hemisphere, it pulls up some of the deep water. So there's mechanical upwelling. And then lots of things happen here in the south. For one, this, so the winds are important for the mean and also for the mixing. So I've done some work with Alex Hall and we thought about is the wind changing in this way of the southern annual mode? What will happen to the ocean atmosphere system? I'm going to go quickly for those who have seen the paper and for those who haven't, you might not want to worry just now. But, but we, we, we can estimate Ekman drifts and we can have some hypothesis of this, this, uh, the speeds of the ACC go up, the winds go up. And I just want to show you actually the record uh, that goes along with this. This is the Southern Annular Mode Index. Uh, if you go to the, just the reanalysis, the US one, you have this horrendous trend. That is actually because the VNS is not very good down there. If you take the more careful data from the, from the BAS, uh, this looks maybe more realistic than uh, that trend. I've done some work to extend the time series back to 1880, uh, using a proxy type approach for mass balance in the atmosphere. I'm using just data from the northern hemisphere to estimate Antarctica. This uses both Antarctica and, and so the, 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 the sites uh, around uh, the south of Africa, America, and, and Australia, and New Zealand. So here's a long record, and again, you can look at it and use a bit of a trend. But what that trend does, it strengthens the wind. This is the black line here. That's the observed trend of the winds. They get stronger over the last 20 years or so. And here are some climate models forecast of what this wind might do in the future. So it might go stronger still. We don't really know, but it's one of the less than us. And what does the wind do? Well, it firstly, you get an Ekman response. And what that means is your density surfaces, if the wind goes stronger, it's already tilted, they're going to go even, the tilt is going to go up. More tilting. But what happens when you have more tilting, you have available potential energy for the eddies to grab, and they're going to flatten it again. Okay, so the eddies are going to spin up, and you're going to flatten the other thickness again. So the question is, how does that play out? And there's no evidence for that. So there's work I did with Klaus and Steve Rintoul on this one, and we used the Argo, the robots that I showed earlier. And what we showed is this over that period where the winds picked up quite a bit, the other didn't change. 
they stayed the same. So your Ekman thinking was completely balanced by the A's. So it's the A's which are fundamentally important in this dynamic. So if you have a model without A's or even parameters in the A's, you won't get that. So here we're doing some work with Slovenia, Tara, from Kiel. And so now we're using a 12-degree Southern Ocean model. And you see what the Southern Ocean looks like, the gray is the sea ice. Fascinating turbulence. Jacks, fronts, eddies. Now, I will not talk about, but you know, if you do paleo work, I mean, these eddies can spawn off here and go a long distance and drop the sediments over here, right? What does that tell you when you do the sediment records? Well, maybe you've seen eddies transiting over a long distance, and then if they reroute, get rerouted by the wind, it looks different, right? That doesn't have to be local. They can transport stuff over a long distance. And what you see with this particular model is you have a 50% increase in the solar wind stress. That, that's what sort of almost was well observed. And you get only a 10% increase in the ACC flux. So that's almost compensation of that slope. Right? So the A's fundamentally modulate the climate there. So last point, Ralph Keeling and I took this idea and said maybe the A's could be important in a paleo context. So what we were thinking of is this record, the Heinrich events, the, main, the big meltwater pulses, right? And you guys know all about it, so we did a little model, which I'm going to skip you over the details. Uh, that's our ocean model, very, very simple. But basically what we said, we put meltwater in the North Atlantic, and that salt is going to go towards the ACC. And what happens on the ACC side, if you get meltwater in, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to change the tune of the other pitfalls. Now the A is going to see that and try to flatten it out again. But what the A is going to do, they're going to take the warm, the heat, and move it south across the ACC, but they're driven by the salinity signal. So it's an interesting paleo, oh, sorry, and, 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 and I really hope that one, that one author cited our works in the audience. I really want to thank you for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> we only had eight citations since, uh, since 2005, which I thought was a spectacular idea, right? <laughs> so maybe our time has yet to come, the realization that the 80s are actually fundamental asset in understanding climate of the past. So a few more words uh, when we're done. So observations are key, paleo and modern, and I'm coming from the global observing system point of view, and I just want to make two points here. And I showed you the Argo network, and I think what's powerful about the Argo network, it's on your iPhone. Right? Everybody can download the data today. Free data sharing across the world. Right? And if you don't do that, I think you're in trouble. And I want to remind you, I mean, I'm in India, I know I should have a Gandhi quote, but I'm, I'm sure Gandhi would have applauded to this, right? <laughs> but this is actually from Thomas Jefferson, 1807, prior to Gandhi. And the fear of knowledge is the common property of all mankind. And any discoveries we can make in it will be for the benefit of every other nation as well as our own. So I think Thomas Jefferson got it right. Patents. The worst idea we ever came up with, right? Whistling data, awful. Right? Who told you that because you have some insights, it's yours, right? I mean, isn't it a collective wisdom that some of we collectively process? So I really want to make a big plea for sharing all our data globally, and really want to uh, sort of uh, make another plea that observations are key because that's what we sort of need to make progress uh, in the future. And I also want to make a third plea. So in the next pages conference, think about the third team, right? Those of the of the Jessicas and the Martins are trying to put data and model together. Thank you very much. say a centimeter, it's maybe a hundred years or don't know some dynamics, maybe it's more. Uh, it's to me more of an average. So you might actually end up not having that big a problem in this type of thing. Okay. I, I will. It does depend how you do it, right? I mean the swatch side and some oxygen minimum zones. And we in the Atlantic it's known as lots of oxygen usually in the minimum zone, but we just covered an eddy that came from the margin with zero oxygen in it. Right? And it has an assembly 
in it that is much more like to a no oxidant condition. So it will drop, and it depends on how you do your proxies, right? Sometimes you just look for a particular species, the abundance of those. So, uh, and there's no guarantee. I mean, if you do a more bulk uh, sedimentary record, which has lots of species in it, you're pretty safe. But when you look for the exotic ones, which some people do do, because it's good reason to do that, then you have to be taking that effect into account when you're thinking at least that you can get the long distance transfer by these eddies. And what's interesting is then, so if you see that, that doesn't mean the climate must have changed locally. Maybe what you're seeing is that the dynamics have shifted such that new transport pathways are possible. And that's all I'm saying. But I think on the, on the net effect of the eddies as transport agent is much more relevant, in particular in the southern hemisphere, and it's not brought out much to your attention because the models of the light that uh, Martin has shown you, I mean, there's no hope to even have boundary currents resolve, and we don't even have coupled models that have these eddies running just yet. So be prepared for some changes, and I was thinking about coupled models once these eddies are there. Your model is uh, fresh water. I don't think the microphone is on. Hold it closely. Yeah. Would you see any effect on the North Pacific with your propagation or something? So the question is, would we see any effect in the North Pacific on eddy propagations? Well, also the North Pacific is a sea of eddies, but again in the north, the boundary currents transport most of the heat and property. So the eddies modulate a bit what happens there, but they're not so essential as they are in the southern hemisphere, because in the southern hemisphere they're the only agents that can easily do a north-south transfer. Well, in the north, the boundary can do its uh, currents can do it themselves. But it is, I'm sure, also important to see of Okosk as it meets sort of the North Pacific, and they play a role there too. One last question. The ADs present out and they are underestimated. Certainly, how they concern the and so on. But for the last last maximum, for example, in climate model, what we see is that the model do not produce the, the deep water properly with colder water and saltier water. So part of it can be due to the transport, but other can be due to the link to the sea as one rejection of the way we, yeah. we do it in high latitudes and in particular around the Antarctica. So what what would be the competition between these three? Yes. So thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. So the other point I should to full disclosure, if you look at ocean models, none of them, I would say, has even something close to the observed deep water production in the south. Even that model that I showed you that looked so nice with the movies and so on, that does not produce any shelf deep water as we see in the record. In fact, it uses all the Antarctic bottom water after 30 years. So, and, and the way they fix it, they did some nudging around Antarctica to get that process in. And, and again, the, the Antarctic bottom water is another key ingredient. It doesn't transport that much heat, though, but it's, it's, it, it does influence the dynamics. And none of our ocean models that we use for climate studies have even halfway a chance to get that right. So we're far away from really doing the full ocean climate problem with models, because it's these key ingredients they just don't have properly done. And mixing is a third problem. It's a tuning parameter to get your MOC right. And if you observe it, it's always a factor of the lower than what you use to tune your models. So there's other challenges there. So I think there's a lot of work ahead of us. And I really appreciate this coming together of the paleo perspective and the modern world. Because in the modern world, you can get away for 10, 15 years was not producing bottom water. But when you want to do paleo studies and you don't have bottom water production, you're out of luck. And I think, unfortunately, that's mostly where we are right now. So it's good for these communities to sort of air their problems and work together. OK, we'll leave it with that.